Let me start with the title of the talk. Uh, the talk is from Activist Filmmaker to Queer Community Elder. Um, originally, there was a subtitle that got dropped somewhere along the line, which was An Unexpected Journey. Titles are inherently reductionist, so I'll elaborate a bit. The unexpected journey part refers to the fact that I've always been pretty inept at making life plans or having conventional goals. I didn't go to university. I never imagined myself becoming a filmmaker, certainly not a documentary filmmaker. The two queer historical documentaries I'm best known for, The Coquettes and We Were Here, both emerged from big bang moments of inspiration rather than from long deliberation. So my presence here today is significantly a result of serendipity, political and artistic passions, and many years of wondering about what am I going to be when I grow up. De zomer is voorbij, het is september en dat betekent weer lekker documentaires kijken. We zijn nu in de Oba in Amsterdam en naast mij staat David Wiseman. Where are you from? Can you tell us that? Well, that's actually not an easy question. I've lived in San Francisco and in Portland, Oregon, but currently I don't live anywhere specific. Oh, so you're like a traveler nowadays. To some degree, yes. You made documentaries about San Francisco, about uh, for old people, talking for young people, how their history was, but you also have yourself an interesting his history. I do. I've lived a relatively unconventional life. And yes, yeah, since uh, 2016, since mm -hmm. Trump was elected, I changed mm -hmm. my life and sold my house and got rid of all of my belongings, and I've been living an unstructured life. Oh, well, welcome yeah, in Amsterdam then. That's a whole other then. story, I yeah, don't know. Yeah, that's really yeah. totally different. Yeah. Um, let us uh, first talk about your first documentary, uh -huh. We Were Here. That's I, the second. That's the second. Yeah, the yeah. first one was uh, uh, called... The Coquettes. Before the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Did I have the nerve to go on stage in a dress? Yes. Before Watergate. Gender confusion. San Francisco gave birth to the legendary. It's so tacky. Magical. Would you like to go up or down? Musical. Immortals of dazzling glamour and artistry. The Cockettes. The notorious group of performers who created a social and sexual revolution that changed America forever. Yeah, I saw that yeah. one as well, but I would like to talk about We Were Here. Okay. And maybe you can uh, tell yourself where it is about. Well, We Were Here is... It's kind of an epic history of the, uh, the AIDS epidemic in San Francisco, but mm -hmm. it's only told through the voices of five people who lived mm -hmm. through it. And the interviews are very rich and deep, and through their journeys through those years, mm -hmm. it creates a kind of an epic sense of what we went through in San Francisco mm -hmm. during the worst of the epidemic. If you had a bus ticket, it better be saying San Francisco, because that was the place to come. I think a lot of us came out here because we didn't quite fit where we were. I like the people here, they just seem more open. And I always wanted to meet a nice blonde surfer. If you took a bunch of young men and said, have as much sex as you can have, how much sex would they have? A lot of sex. All of America was feeling very confident that you could be much more sexual, and that was okay. Eighty-one was a big year. That is when everything changed. I remember looking in the window of Star Pharmacy, and there were these little Polaroid photographs. Watch out, guys, there's something out there. The first time I heard about AIDS, I think it was called the gay cancer. We had friends who were dying right at the beginning of the epidemic. I was hanging blood one day in the hospital and the infectious disease fellow came in and said, Eileen, why don't you put gloves on? We don't know what this is. How are you getting it? Who are you getting it from? Who's giving it to who? Everybody was reading the obituaries because they went from like this to like this. Our principal response was food banks and care programs and it was a response that America should be proud of. It changed people's view of the gay community in a huge way. Again and again, in every situation, there's lesbians there leading the fight. None of my friends are around from the beginning, so I want to tell their story as much as I want to tell my story.
I felt very emotional watching the documentary actually and then I was, uh, saw you being interviewed by the audience here in the library in Amsterdam and you were saying that you lost all your family in the Second World War, your Jewish family. My mother's family yeah. uh, was wiped out but this, that was yeah. long before I was born but my mother when she was a child moved to the United States. It's because I refer to my gay friends over here as family mm -hmm. and so it must have felt like in the uh, HIV epidemic in the San Francisco you might have felt lost for the second time your family. Is that how you felt a little bit if you feel well, lose so many friends? I mean that was the first real experience of communal loss for me was mm -hmm. the AIDS epidemic. I mean and I could reflect back on what previous generations had experienced in their mm -hmm. own situations of loss. But uh, you know it was very the suffering and the fear and the and the politics within the AIDS epidemic was very much confined yeah. to a, a community that was not popular. Yeah, so exactly. the church was against this and the government was against this. So the film really deals with uh, the way the San Francisco community coalesced and came together to fight for care, to fight for political change, to fight for medications when no one else would help us. Yeah, and I think a lot of people forgot actually there was a plan in late 80s, begin 90s, to put people with AIDS and HIV in concentration camps. I saw that in your documentary and I forgot about it and it really gave me the shivers. How was that for you to see that again back in your own documentary? Well, you know, again, it was part of a, of a larger picture mm -hmm. of political resistance to uh, doing anything for the gay community. I think a lot of people both in the, in the right wing of the government and also in the church felt like we were getting what we deserved. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of, of locking people up was one, one particular activist's uh, it's so scary if you yeah, think Yeah, all of it was very scary. I yeah. mean, it was scary to be living through it then. Um, mm -hmm. uh, people were afraid to go to restaurants in San Francisco because so many of the waiters were gay. I mean, it was a terrifying time. And, you know, as it evolved and as we cut, found our bearing, mm -hmm. you know, we found ways of both enlisting the outside community but also doing our own fighting to mm -hmm. take care of ourselves. How do you feel about it? Because you lost so many friends. Do you feel like a sort of bitterness? Because like the young people are intending to be really open-minded and really easy going with HIV? Older generations always feel like young persons, the young people don't learn from history regardless mm -hmm. of what the issue is. And it's mm -hmm. frustrating because on some level the lessons learned from history are valid. Mm -hmm. And regardless of whether it's HIV that's a risk, uh, you know, one never knows. And I think the, the deeper questions one hopes come out of an experience like that yeah. is who are we as a mm -hmm. sexual people? Mm -hmm. what, how do we relate to our own bodies? How do we relate to our sexual partners? What yeah. does sex mean as a gay person? So I mm -hmm. hope that on some level, uh, these are conversations that are being had regardless of what the specific risk might be. What I don't think we consciously thought about in regard to the epidemic was that there was no VE day. There was no day that the epidemic ended and we could all celebrate and go out and have a drink together and, you know, commiserate about what we had lived through. Basically what happened is that the drugs started getting a little bit better and the death rate started slowing down. But mostly the experience was a kind of a winding down of the horror and a kind of an attempt to ease back into some sense of normalcy. Um, in a way, the epidemic had become its own normalcy for us. Uh, I think in any crisis situation, um, you have to do that as a means of coping because you can't live in a constant sense of crisis. The, the epidemic sort of became the new normal. Um, and so as the 90s started to move into the 2000s, basically it stopped becoming the number one main focus of everyone's lives. And slowly, you know, moved on. and. Up until I started making We Were Here, there, were, there had been nothing really, uh, as far as I know, even in books, that really took a historical, <coughs> historical look back at what we had gone through. And so in a sense, what I was, I was doing the first, and I think other people were starting to work on similar things right around the same time. Is it maybe also one of the reasons you wanted to create your new doc documentary? Can you tell us about uh, your new documentary a little bit more? Well, the new project is focused on uh, gay men who realized they were gay in the decades before Stonewall. Mm -hmm. So the youngest one at the time of filming was 72. The idea with this project was to capture the stories of gay men who realized they were different long before the modern gay liberation movement offered a public context for positive self-image. These pre-Stonewall experiences are qualitatively different from those experiences of any of us whose coming out came after gay liberation. Some of them didn't even know that other, any other gay people existed. There was mm -hmm. obviously no internet. 
Were they out of the closet? Before no, there was Stonewall? no such thing. There was, uh, there was no such mm -hmm. thing. I mean, so okay. these are these. Are, I mean, one of these guys found mm -hmm. out that there were other gay people by reading the graffiti in a toilet stall, but most of them oh. thought I'm the only person that has these feelings. So, young man, what's your name? <laughs> Kirby Lauderdale. Wow. And how old are you, Kirby? I'm 77. Which means you were born in 1938. Wow. Today we'll hear how some couples cope with the devastating news that their spouse was gay. Kirby and Linda, you are now divorced. That's correct. But you were married for 18 years. Right. What did the counselor say? Have a good marriage, have a good sex life, and it'll go away. <laughs> They're the last generation that experienced that. True, of the complete yeah. invisibility and the complete lack of a political context for <coughs> feeling good about who they are. Mm -hmm. So the idea was to capture these stories. And in the process of doing so, I've worked with young gay men as editors mm -hmm. because I wanted the storytelling to be told by a cross-generational collaboration. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's been a wonderful experience for both, for mm -hmm. me, for the mm -hmm. young editors who are learning a lot, and also for these older men who are being valued wow. and witnessed at a time of life yes. when they feel invisible often. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I want to say right now before I forget that I love old age. Old age agrees with me at this point. I mean, I've been through so many uh, trials and tribulations of, about my identity that uh, I'm very firm in my identity now. Very interesting, a very emotional, very beautiful mate, and lots of history we forgot about. So it's very important you make these kind of documentaries. Are there any other things you like to make a documentary about? No, I think the form and the medium is not important to me. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm a storyteller and I'm interested in history and I'm a political activist, so I think that will take different forms. But I don't feel particularly interested in making more films at this point. Oh. I'll be doing my storytelling in other modalities. Yeah, and it was very interesting meeting you. And it was Thank a you. very nice Mosser reading here again in the OBA. And you can update yourself by going to the Mosser website or just like Google it. But thank you so much for this interview and my for pleasure. your time. And tot de volgende keer bij MVS. Thank you. So I am feeling this kind of increased um, engagement within our community across generations around both sharing stories with each other and around making sure that our history is captured for future generations. So that's kind of like a good ending. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I'm 33. I'm young, super young. But, <laughs> oh, you're young. <laughs> but um, I, I guess my question is, you know, I talk to a lot of my peers or even the ones that are younger, and you know, they'll say things like, Oh, I was at the bathhouse and it was all old guys or this or that. And I say, well, you're going to be that guy. So how do you get young people to watch what you've made? Because it sounds really fascinating and interesting. And how do I get my peers to be interested? Well, that's the million dollar question. Um, you know, there's a lot of mystery there, and I think that you can say something to your friends about being at the baths and making those comments that older people can't, because there's nothing worse than finger-wagging from us older folks. So I think it's one of the things that I encourage people who are younger, who have a, an interest and consciousness around this kind of stuff, to find that leadership capacity within yourself, to try to open conversations that you might not have had with your friends or that they might not have had and start be a catalyst in your own realm. Um, as to how to get people to watch the work, again, one doesn't know. And initially I was making this for posterity. I wasn't making it for public screenings, the Gay Elders piece at least. And it has become a very public project in ways that I hadn't anticipated. And in many ways the, the audience coming is older and they're really appreciating it. So I don't have any problem with that. And, you know, eventually things find their way. I want to be more than just someone who sits in an armchair and tells stories about how nice it was, or great it was, or exciting it was, and want to be equal to a youthful person, and don't want to be labeled necessarily with this loaded definition of gay elder. Well, you here, know, it's like... It's like a bit of age, it's a kind of... Well, it depends on how you carry it. I mean, it really depends on how you carry yourself and how you utilize that position. And I do think that, that, you know, if you ask people, do you fuck more for your pleasure or do you fuck more for your partner's pleasure? 
uh, and you get very different answers. But I think in the telling of stories, I think it's a really important question to ask ourselves: Am I telling this story because I get pleasure out of telling my stories, or am I telling my stories because I think that there has there's specific value in this moment to this particular situation? And I think the intentionality of telling stories for a reason is crucial to good eldering. Yeah, but I'm, I'm talking about. I feel as younger as I was before as I do as old as I am. That's all right. <laughs> but you're older than me. <laughs> and younger Bitch. than you. <laughs> My name is Jack Sol Lassner, and I'm 86. So I was born in 1927 a long time ago. <laughs> I try to stay in shape, stretching and lifting and so a couple hours a day. Unfortunately, they closed the, the steam room. <laughs> that was the saddest thing ever. Why did they close the steam room? For too much fucking around. They don't trust us. You do go downhill, don't you, after a certain time. You can't stay young and beautiful forever. Talking to you is, is therapeutic in a way. It's, it's good to bring out some of these things, especially at, you know, at end of life. It opens up a lot of memories, things you forgot completely about and places where you've been. You know, it's, it's a new experience for me. I, I usually take the pictures. A lot of mysteries in life, but uh, things sort themselves out. <laughs>